If Jesus didn't die and rise again, we have no Savior. If Jesus wasn't willing to come and give his life on the cross of Calvary, we have no eternal home. If Jesus didn't promise to come back and take us out of this world, then we're stuck here. Everything is Jesus, and we ought to be thankful for Jesus. He is enough. He provides everything, and we ought to want more of him, no doubt about it. Find Acts chapter 9 this morning. Acts chapter 9, just got a question. Is God pricking you? Is God pricking you? Acts chapter 9. Find your place. Please stand with me uh, this morning. feel like God's led us really this month just trying to prep our hearts for the revival to come, uh, the revival in May. But truthfully, we can have revival right now. <laughs> a revival will come if you'll just submit and surrender yourself to God. Recognize your sinful ways and turn that over. Repent of that and turn to the Lord. You can have revival. We don't have to wait on Brother Woodcock to get here or May 5th to get here. You can have it. And we need it. There's no doubt in this day we need it. So the question this morning is, is God pricking you? Acts chapter 9, look at me at verse 3. The Bible says, as he journeyed, this is Paul, Saul at the time, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined a light, sound, I'm so sorry. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Verse 4, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Verse 5, where we get our question from. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Father, I thank you for the precious word of God. Help my voice. Help Caden's hands, Lord. I pray the message would honor and glorify you. But Lord, I pray that it's more than just words. I pray that it's more than just a message, Lord. Holy Spirit, we need you to intervene. Holy Spirit, we need you to prick hearts. Holy Spirit, we need you to open our eyes to the understanding of the truth that's being preached here this morning, God. My plea, Lord, is if anybody here is doubting their salvation, or Lord, maybe they're trusting in anything besides Jesus Christ, please, Holy Spirit, prick them this morning that they may not continue to kick against it, and that they would submit themselves to repentance and trust and faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Seeing the love of God, Lord, may they see it this morning. Father, those of us that are saved, please help us. Help us, dear God. You know as well as I do, Lord, that once we're saved, we don't live a sinless life. And Father, we can get distracted by the things of this world, and boy, they'll snare us, they'll get us, God. But I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit of God that's within us. And I pray this morning that that would be evidenced as you would prick our hearts in any area of our life that needs to be changed. And that we would be humble enough, have the humility to surrender, repent, and give our lives back to you, Father. You have your will in your way. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for dying on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for everybody that's here this morning. And thank you for your love to us. May we see a little bit of it this morning. I ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen. I appreciate you standing. You can be seated. Is God pricking you? I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I go through my mind and I wonder, am I doing right? Am I doing what God would have me to do? Or am I doing wrong? How do I know that I'm doing right? How do I know that I'm in God's will? How do I know uh, what's going on in this life is what it should be? How, do I, how am I for sure of everything that I hear or think about? What, what is going on? Can I say it this way? What is our measuring stick? <laughs> it's not our feelings and emotions. It can't be our measuring stick. I said it in Sunday school. I'll say it again. Our emotions go up and down, right? They're pretty rampant. They change constantly. Our measuring stick cannot be you. I cannot look in the mirror and say, this is the measuring stick. I can't look at my neighbor and say, you're the measuring stick. I can't look at my friend or other member of the church or my spouse and say, you're the measuring stick of how I know I am where I need to be, how I know that I'm fulfilling your will in my life, how I, I know that I am pleasing in your eyes. If I can look in the mirror and say, yeah, I feel I did good today. Or if I can look over and say, I'm not as bad as that individual or I'm not as bad as that individual None of those things, to include your feelings and emotions, are the measuring stick. God is giving us something, has given us something that is the measuring stick, and that is the Word of God. Uh, we're going to talk about Paul, and Paul was very sincere in what he did, but he was still lost. 
Paul was very zealous in his beliefs and his religion and the law as he took it. Was a teacher of the law, yet he was still lost. He was still wrong. And so there's a mechanism or a way that God has deemed in this life if it's not you and if it's not me and if it's not feelings and emotions and if it's not visions and it's not dreams and it's, and it's not an audible speaking of God, then what have you given me, God, that would make me to understand or help me to understand or guide me in this life? And this is the Word of God, along with the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus asked a question to Paul. He says, really it's a statement, it is hard for to kick against the pricks. Saul's on his way to do what he's always done, be zealous for the law, be zealous for religion. He's going now to really capture some individuals, bind them, men, women, children, doesn't matter, and haul them off to Jerusalem. And on his way, Jesus meets him, and he states this. I'm going to say it again, and we'll get right in it. He says, It is hard for thee to kick it's the pricks. This is in reference to what's called a goad. Goad, okay. Would be an ox goad. If you look in Judges 3.31 or look up here real quick, it says, And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he delivered Israel. An ox goad is a tool. Okay, it is a uh, piece of equipment that would be used to Guide ox. I see ox don't get bits in their mouth and are steered by horses. Not that I'm a rancher, but uh, I did do some research on this to figure it out. That most ox are placed into a yoke, and how they would then move those oxen because they're not with reins is with a goad. And they would use the goad, right? Sometimes it's a stick of a goad. Sometimes they use the the uh, bull whip or whatever it may be. But they would use a goad, and on the end of the goad would be a point, and they would the ox to get it to go where it needs to go and if the ox was like most people today and very stubborn he would prick the goad and if he pricked the goad there would be a pain with that and the the ox would then react or change its behavior due to the pricking of the goad everybody with me and that's why he says it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks now if the ox would get pricked and decide not to move in that direction it would come against then the point would go deeper into the ox, and naturally that would be more painful for the ox. So it would behoove the ox to avoid the pain and go in the direction away from the goad, the pricking, so that it would be driving of the oxen. Everybody with me so far? Make sense? This pricking is in reference to an ox goad. It would be a tool that would encourage, if I could say it that way, for the ox to obey the driver or the master. And if they would kick against or resist it, then it would go deeper and it would hurt them. So it would do the ox some good to adhere to the prick or the prod of the ox code. So if we go back to the text and we look, then Jesus had to be pricking Paul's heart. I mean, it's a clear statement. It says, it is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So Jesus had been kind of encouraging Paul along the way to change his direction, to change his behavior. Jesus saw something in Paul. God saw something in Paul. Jesus died for everybody. We're not Calvinists around here. And Paul had to make the decision to place a faith and trust in Jesus just like you and I did. But there's this pricking that's occurring in Paul's heart. Paul was not listening or heeding to the pricks, which we would call today conviction. The conviction of God, but rather he's kicking against them. Now listen, the goal of repentance, the goal of the pricking, the goal of the prodding is for you to change your behavior. You see, God's not pricking or prodding you because he's mad at you. You might think that because you're kicking against the prick. The pain hurts more because you're not responding to the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God to have repentance. You see, God does not desire for you to live in wickedness. God doesn't want you to live in wickedness. God doesn't want you to live in sinfulness. Yes, God will chasten you because he loves you. And God will chasten you harder because he loves you. And something's going on in Paul's life 
that Jesus says it's hard for you to continue to kick against these pricks. In other words, God's convicting Paul, and Paul is trying to evade that, but it's hurtful, if you will, if you think about the illustration of the prodding. It's going to drive Paul to make a change in his life. Can I just pause for a minute? If you're saved here this morning, you've come to that place. Right? You've come to the bottom of the rope, no matter what it is for anybody. I don't care if you've lived in sin your entire life, as in whatever you want to define sin as, or as if you've grown up in the perfect church and you were the perfect little child, right? Like my granddaughter is. But I'm just saying, it doesn't matter where you're at, right? You have a sinful nature within you. And you had to come to that place of realizing and recognizing, I can't get to heaven without Jesus Christ. Now listen, if we're honest, we've tried a lot of things in this world, if unfortunately you lived in a sinful life, to recognize and realize it didn't work. Maybe you haven't got into sin, but you've tried every religion under the sun. You had to come to the truth of knowing what the Word of God said, that Jesus died for your sins, for you to be saved. How did you get there? It was the pricking, the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God, opening your eyes to the truth. It's the exact same thing that happened in Paul's life. Yes, Paul is one of the greatest missionaries. Paul is, some of us would say, a supernatural individual. But he was under the conviction of God, just as a human being, as we are as well. And he wasn't listening. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. I, I say this, and I'm not being tongue-in-cheek, although I don't want God to persecute me, but I'm thankful for the pricking. I'm thankful for the conviction in my life. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit of God is willing to prod at me to make a change in my behavior that I can be pleasing unto God. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, I want you to see the goal. Now, I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. Everybody understands the difference. You've been caught, caught in your guilt. Most kids are sorry, right? There's not a true repentance because the kid will go back to the cookie jar and steal the cookie again the next day. They're sorry they got caught. Unfortunately, many of us are the same way. We're sorry that we got caught, but we didn't have a true godly repentance. There's a difference. Okay, The Bible says, now I rejoice that you were made sorry, but that you were sorrowed to repentance, a change in behavior, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. Why? That she might receive damage by us in nothing, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Now there's, I, I, be careful saying this, there's two types of this repentance, right? Every one of us needs to understand the repentance to turn to God for salvation. That's my way is no good. My way is going to put me in a devil's hell. My works will get me in hell. But if I trust and believe in Jesus Christ that died on the cross of Calvary, I now have salvation, as in eternal salvation. You with me? But now every day as God's sanctifying me, I also need repentance to make sure that I'm saving myself from the destructions of this world. You with me? And godly repentance helps me to eschew hate evil. Let me just say this way. Sin ought to, and i got to be careful how I word this, sin ought to make us feel bad. There's no repentance if sin doesn't make us feel bad. You with me? If I live in sin and then I get caught in something like, oh, I'm sorry, and then I do it again and I do it again, again. there's no true repentance, right? John the Baptist said before he would baptize them, fruits of repentance. It's not a works thing. John's just saying, you give evidence that you believe in Jesus Christ. And before we accuse John the Baptist of anything, we probably do the exact same things with who we are, right? We want to see some fruits of that salvation, not because we're trying to be Pharisees, but I'll be honest with you, my heart is because eternal life is probably one of the most important things, if not the most important thing. And the world teaches so many different things. With me? I want to make sure upon Scripture, because I can't open your heart and look in there and see it, are you saved? Knowledge doesn't save. We're going to see that in just a moment. Knowing doesn't save. It is a trust, a belief that gives you eternal life. And I can't see into your heart to see that. Now, the slippery slope to that is you can turn over a new leaf and try to come in here smiling all the time and say you're a Christian, right? I don't know what's going on in your home life, right? But there are fruits of repentance. When Paul was pricked in his heart in verse 5, he said, okay, Lord, who are you? In verse 6, he says, oh, I know who you are. And you'll see later in verse 20, there was fruits, evidence of his repentance. So Paul's being pricked in his heart. And it's a very, very interesting thought for the purpose of why we see 
because he wants to change his behavior. He wants to get him to where he needs him to be. Certainly Paul needed it for salvation. But he also needed it to stay in line. For Paul later, and I'm jumping a little bit, but later he tried to go into Asia to preach, and the, and the Word of God says the Spirit suffered him not. That was a prodding of the Holy Spirit of God that now is not the time to go into Asia. So it's not just a prodding for salvation. It is a prodding to keep us in line and keep us into obedience. Everybody with me? So first thing we see is God uses his word. God uses his word. Turn over to Ecclesiastes with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I, I'm not trying to be mean this morning. I'm, I'm obviously passionate. There's too many people in this world that say, I feel this way. Or too many people in this world that said, God is all love. And too many people in this world that says, well, God knows my heart. Okay? Yes, God does know your heart. Yes, God does love you. Yes, God is love. But listen, folks, if you veer away from this thing and you make decisions based upon your own feelings and emotions, you are not going to fulfill what God would have you to do. Everybody with me? Listen, you can feel good and feel like your works are going to get you to heaven all day long. I don't want you to go to an eternal devil's hell. Neither did God. God doesn't want you trusting in anything besides Jesus Christ. What kind of a Christian, a lover of God, would we be if we didn't ex explain to you true uh, gospel salvation, right? Now, what kind of a Christian, what kind of a lover of God would we be if we just say, yeah, just go if you want to. Sure, God knows you're, you're good to go. Everything, just, just do whatever. Absurd. Let me get a better illustration. All right, is everybody happy with everything that's going on in America today? Well, why not? I feel like I should be able to do that. Ecclesiastes 12. Look at me at verse 11. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 11. Look what the Bible says. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm sorry, verse 11. 10. We'll start there. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even the words of truth. Even words of truth. Praise God, we got his thy word is truth. Right? We got the word of God. Now look what he says in verse 11. Verse 11. The words of the wise are as what? What's that next word? Goads. What does the goad do? Pricks the oxen. What does the goad do in your life? Pricks your heart. Everybody with me? So that means somewhere along Paul's life, the word of God must have been pricking his heart, if the Bible's true. The words of the wise are as goads. And as nails fastened to the ma by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Many of us got this memorized, but I would like you to see it. Hebrews chapter 4. So there's a pricking, a prodding going on in Paul's life. What is God using? Well, according to Ecclesiastes, he's using the word of God. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. This is where we say we have the true living word of God. The word of God is quick. It's alive. And powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Here it is. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Don't take this the wrong way. God doesn't care how you feel. He does. He loves you. But God doesn't care how you feel. You can't say, well, God, I just feel like doing this. Now, if you were a child and you had parents, which everybody in here was, some of us a long time ago, how did that fare out for you when you went to mom and dad? Say, I don't care what you want. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Probably got a little bit of an attitude adjustment, right? May have come from a leather belt. May have come from a broken spoon. Who knows, right? Why did they do that? Because they loved us. They certainly were going to let us do what we wanted to do. Why is that? Because they don't want us to end up in the penitentiary someday, right? They wanted us to be obedient good citizens of America. I know it's hard to believe today, but some folks are still doing that. I don't know why I said that. Anyway, it is living of God. And it is a discerner of our thoughts and the intents of our heart. In other words, is God pricking you according to Scripture? How do I know that I'm doing right or wrong? It's according to the Scripture. Say 98% of your life will be okay if you follow this thing. There's plenty for you to do in here to quit worrying about everything that you think you ought to be doing. There's plenty in here to keep you busy, I promise you that. Keep you busy for a lifetime. Life can be simpler if we would adhere to the pricking, the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God according to his 
word, his Bible. So the word opens our eyes and gives us the knowledge for the spirit to prick us with what we do see and know to make application. A revival guy, uh, an evangelist said this, we spend a lot of time explaining the Bible, but very little time believing it. One day someone is going to pick up a Bible and believe it, and that person will change the world. I can't help but think of Paul. He knew, had a knowledge, was a teacher of the law. But when God got a hold of him and he got saved, he changed the world for Christ Jesus. Same thing for us. We have the Bible, the same God. Paul had plenty of knowledge. He was a, a teacher of the law. You go to Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to throw the phone up here, Acts 22. Go to Philippians with me. Philippians Acts 2 says, I am verily a man, which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, city of Sicilia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel would be one of the rabbinical teachers. He would be like the, the, the Harvard, Harvard or the Yale of the day. And taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous towards God. So he knew the Old Testament. He was a teacher of the law. Had all the knowledge in the world in his mind. Was even zealous towards God. He had a lot of knowledge. Philippians 3. Is everybody else there? Philippians 3. Look at me in verse 5 and 6. Philippians 3, 5 and 6. The Bible says this. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law. What's that next word? Blameless. If the Pharisees looked at Saul at the time, who's Paul, and said, is this guy doing what we need to do? Is he meeting all the wickets? Saul's the cream of the crop. He's the number one in the flock. He is the one that's doing it all. He is zealous and sincere about what he believes and knows. But he's wrong and he's lost. He's so zealous and he's so sincere, he's willing to see people die. Acts chapter 7, we won't read it. Stephen, preaching. Right? He basically comes out, he's full of the Holy Spirit of God, they're accusing him of some things, and Stephen goes out there and he says, listen, you bunch of heathens. <laughs> he doesn't say it that way, but he says, you guys are so stuck on men. He says, your fathers killed the prophets. We had Moses, and we had Abraham, and we had prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet, and you guys didn't listen to him. Prophet after prophet after prophet, word after word after word, and you guys are just like your fathers. You're refusing all of that. And then he says, I sure hope you understand the truth. Then he says, y'all are the one who killed Jesus Christ. He lays it all on the line. I want you to see something that happens, okay? Turn me to Acts chapter 7. Stephen's preaching. He's, he's given a message. He's full of the Holy Spirit of God. He's biblical. Tells him all of these things. And look what he says in verse 51. Verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always, what's that next word? Resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. What's the definition of insanity? I forget what it is. You do the same thing over and over and over and expect a different result. Isn't that the definition of insanity? <laughs> You're teachers of the law. You have all the knowledge in the world. You know everything that happened, and yet you're still resisting. The pricking of God in your heart. He says, you resist the Holy Ghost. You resist the Holy Ghost. Verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have now been the betrayers and murderers. Well, there's a honey message. You killed Jesus is basically what he tells them. It says they've been doing opposite of the law. Verse 53, it says, who, bear, who have received the law by uh, the disposition of the angels and have not kept it. Y'all people think you're all that. <laughs> and you killed Jesus and ain't kept the, own, the law that you're teaching. You haven't even kept. You're a bunch of hypocrites, right? Jesus would call them whited sepulchers. Holy on the outside, dead on the inside. They were pricked in their hearts. Look what happened in verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the what? Heart. What was their reaction? They have not, and have not kept, I'm sorry. They were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. 
And then ultimately, what they do? And they cast him out of the city, stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet, whose name was... Ah! Saul was present for that message. Saul knew the holy word of God, right? He knew the law. He was a teacher of the law. And now Stephen just illustrates it for him. Stephen just preaches the message for him. Saul's there and hears the preaching of the word of God. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He hears this preaching. Chapter 8, verse 1, you'll find where Saul was consenting unto his death, Stephen. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Paul not only saw at the time, not only heard the message, but he heard the very words of Stephen say this. This is Stephen, calling upon God, kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, Lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Saul hears the message. He sees the life of Stephen all the way to Stephen's death. And he says, don't lay this sin upon them. Chapter 8, he'll pick up and begin his persecuting of people. But he heard the word of God. There was a pricking, a prodding that occurred with the Pharisees at the time. They reacted in the wrong manner. Paul was present and also consenting to Stephen's death. No doubt hearing Stephen preach then consenting to kill him. And we know that it rang true in his heart. You flip over to chapter 22, verse 20, look what he says. This is Paul. He says this in his defense, if you will. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I, was also, I, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So not only the preaching, but the action of Saul at the time, later to become Paul, was naturally upon his mind and his heart that God was using to prick his heart. So the very first thing we see that God uses, how do I know I'm doing right? How am I doing that I'm doing it according to God's way? It's not in my emotion, feelings and emotions. It's not in me. I'm not the measuring stick. The word of God is the measuring stick. So now I have the knowledge. Saul had knowledge. I have knowledge. I understand what the Word of God says. I need something else. That's the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost is what's needed. God uses His Spirit. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're we'll going to be flying through some verses, so you stay with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. So the Word of God opens my eye, I'm sorry, gives me the knowledge, but I need something to teach me and show me. Verse 9 of chapter 2, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his what? Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Jump down to verse 12 with me. Same chapter, verse 12. Verse 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So we have the knowledge, the word of God. God has preserved his word. We have it. We can open it. We can see it. We can read it. But we have to have the Holy Spirit of God to reveal it to us. The word is provided so that the Spirit of God can work for us to make application. It has nothing to do with education. It has nothing to do with your point of view. It has nothing to do with your opinion, your emotion, or your feelings. Paul was educated. He would even call the Lord, Lord, in Acts chapter 9, verse 5. But in verse 6, something different happens. He had to succumb to the truth. He had to change his behavior to the pricking that was occurring in his heart. And that's what he would say in verse 6. Ah, Lord, what would that have me to do? The Holy Spirit of God has now opened his eyes to all this knowledge that he has. The Spirit of God is revealing it to him. But he still has to succumb to that truth. The truth in of itself was not enough if he didn't yield to it. 1 Samuel chapter 3, Samuel is in the, the, uh, the tent serving 
Three times the Lord calls Samuel. What does Samuel do? He gets up, goes to Eli. Gets up, goes to Eli. The third time he gets up and goes to Eli, Eli says, hang on, I ain't calling you, son. It's got to be the Lord. And I love the scripture. As at other times. The voice didn't change. The way he called didn't change. Nothing changed. It was the exact same. And he says, thy servant heareth. He was ministering unto the Lord. He had a knowledge. But that morning after the fourth time, he finally succumbed to that truth through the pricking, the prodding of the Holy Spirit of God. Knowledge in of itself will not save us. Knowledge in of itself will not keep us. Listen, the truth and the work of the Spirit with the truth cannot be divorced. They cannot be separated. John 16, 13 says the Holy Spirit of God will guide us in all truth to reprove the world of what? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. You ought to be thankful that the Holy Spirit of God is in this world. One day it's not going to be. Knowing, hearing, and seeing the word of God were the pricks done by the Holy Ghost to Paul as well as to us. There's no doubt God's word was years. The life of Stephen, the law that Paul knew. But sadly, not everybody yields to that. Agrippa would say, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. There'd be another one that said, I just came to see you do tricks. James chapter 2 verse 19 says this, The devils know and tremble. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Knowing in of itself, if you're a G.I. Joe fan, knowing is half the battle. Knowing, Holy Spirit prodding and pricking for us to make a change. Even though Saul knew, was educated, and was sincere in his belief, it was not enough. Job 9.4 says this, He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Look at that. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered. Can I just pause for a minute before I hit this last point? It's amazing to me how God could do so much for us. Providing Jesus Christ for our salvation. And I'd say many of us in this room have given a testimony of salvation and we're saved. And then we would not do God's will in our life. And it's not because of God. He's still it's because of our decision to say, I don't care about the Word of God and I'm not going to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Sad. Absolutely sad. Saul had plenty of knowledge, but that morning something different happened. The Holy Spirit of God revealed it to him and he had to make a decision. Hence he said, What wilt thou have me to do? The Holy Spirit is used by God to open our eyes to God's Word. And the result, here's where people get all mad and finicky. The result is fruit. The result is fruit. If you look in verse 20, it said, And he straightway preached that Jesus is the Son of God. The very thing he was persecuting people for that he was against. Not too long after he was saved, he was all in. Something else that's interesting about Saul, Saul's the man. He's got the papers. He's the leader. He's given the commands. On that road, he'd be blind. Number one, he would have to wait for God to tell him what to do. Saul wasn't used to that. He would be led as a blind man by probably some men he wasn't completely aware of. He would be fed by some people he wasn't aware of. He would be baptized by someone he didn't know. He would be discipled by those in Damascus who he was going to kill. You with me? There was some humility. Come on. There was some change in his life. I don't know about you, and I'm not trying to be mean. I'm tired of people saying a prayer and living their own life the way they want to live it. Why is that? Not because I'm mad at them. I'm really mad at the religion that's lying to them and fooling them into going into a devil's hell. They think because they said some prayer that their life is good to go, but there's never been any change in their life. That's sad. You ought to be sad. The love of Christ constrained us to persuade men, right? Everybody with me? They're going to die and go to a devil's hell. And truthfully, we're going to allow it if we don't give them some edu education, some scripture, some knowledge. And this world's full of it. He said, no, it's not. <laughs> Look at the ungodly people's lifestyles. You can't tell me how to change my feelings and my emotions. The world's full of it. 
How does God make us know that we're doing right? He gives us the scripture. He gives us the Holy Spirit of God. And lastly, we'll have a service to the Lord. We'll give our lives to God. God uses service truthfully to keep us in line. You say, I don't know about that. <laughs> Turn with Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. I don't know if I put it up here or not. I didn't. Matthew chapter 11. So God uses the word to give us the knowledge. God uses the Holy Spirit of God to open our eyes. We have to respond to that. We have to make a decision. He doesn't force us. Once we make that decision, how do we know that we are doing it? Well, one of the ways we can know is that God uses service. He uses our service, our surrender to him. Look what Matthew chapter 11 verse 29 says. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know if you know what a yoke is. I'm terrible at it. Point in illustrations, but imagine that I'm an ox. <laughs> Don't do that. Imagine that I'm standing here and I got a yoke, a big piece of wood on my neck, and there's another individual over and he's got a big piece of wood on their neck, okay? It's connected, then there's a little who yacht goes around, connects this neck, and another one goes around, connects this neck. You with me? So we're on a board. I want to go this way. That one wants to go that way. Is it happening? No, it ain't happening. I can try, and I'm going to get tired, and I'm going to hurt. With me? Now, we can step and step, right? Or I can try to drag that ox along. Is that going to go well? It's not going to go well. Everybody with me? Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. Jesus says, I will provide rest. You know what Jesus is saying? Serve with me. Walk with me. Believe me. Let me be the leader in your life. Let me be the one that's walking right along with you. Come on. You know as well as I do when you buck and you kick against the pricks, life is not good. When you feel the conviction of God upon your life, you're not comfortable. Let's be honest. You say, I've never felt that. Then you need to come see me at the end of service to make sure that you know you're saved. If there is no conviction in your life, you're not saved according to that book, not according to Dean Francini. And when you live your life the way you want to, that's an opposed, is, is in opposition to God. It should be, it better be, I hope it's absolutely uncomfortable for you. Until so you have godly sorrow and you turn to repentance. And you never want to be there again. I promise you, because Saul brought it up two or three times in Scripture, he never wanted to be Saul again. He was thanking God, he was Paul. Service is evidence of our salvation. Service is evidence of our repentance. I already mentioned it, but the love of Christ constraineth us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 16, Paul said this, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woo! That should be an application for everybody in this room. If you're a born-again believer, whoa, if I don't tell somebody else about Jesus Christ. Can I add one to you? Whoa, if I see somebody walking in sin, walking towards that cliff, walking out in front of that bus, and I don't apply Galatians 6.1 and say, whoa, 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 don't go that way, friend. Don't go that way. It's not going to end well. Don't do it. But it'll never happen if you don't succumb to the truth and yield to the Holy Spirit of God. Something happens to a person when God gets a hold of them and God indwells them. It is the preaching of the Word of God with the Spirit pricking our hearts to result in a purpose, a purposeful repentance, yielding to the conviction and turning to God. Paul heard the Word and led him to repentance. He decided to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, a salvation, and he completely surrendered to God. Against all odds. You realize that? Everything Saul had ever known was gone the moment he trusted in Jesus Christ. But everything was given to Saul when he became Paul as an everlasting life and treasures immeasurable. Yeah, he lost every friend he thought he had. He lost all of his fame. He lost all of his fortune. He lost all of that. So he thought, here we are preaching about him 2,000 years later. He lost everything, but he said he counted it as dung to gain everything in Christ Jesus, friend. Can I just tell you this morning, please, 
Don't trust in your knowledge. Take the knowledge, yield to the Holy Spirit of God, have true repentance, and serve God. Be in the yoke with Jesus Christ. There's nothing better. Paul heard it, led him to repentance, salvation, he completely surrendered to God. What do you do with the preached word of God? What do you do with the reading of the word of God? Can I ask you, are you kicking against the pricks? Can I just get a little bit deeper? Why would you continue in the pain? I don't know about you, but sometimes I walk around and I feel like I got a boulder in my shoe. Like my foot's going to rip in half if I don't get it out. And I pull the shoe off and I shake it and I can't even see that little stone that falls out of that thing. Right? Come on, you, you don't like that feeling? Why would you continue to go down a road when God says, I want to lift that burden from you? I want to take it from you. Where are you at this morning? Are you saved? Are you 100% sure that you're going to heaven? You say, yeah, I'm saved. And God's prodding you to do something. God's pricking your heart. The conviction of the Holy Spirit of God is saying, do this. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. Where are you at? It doesn't have to be painful. You can come to God right now, just like the prodigal son. I say, I'm sorry, Lord. 1 John 1, 9. You confess. He's faithful. Why live in an area that's uncomfortable when you can repent and turn from that? I'm going to end with this. If you're sitting here this morning and you think your parents can get you to heaven, you think your good works can get you to heaven, you think your knowledge of the Bible can get you to heaven, you think your being a good person can get you to heaven, please understand it didn't work for Saul who said he was perfect and blameless in the law. Jesus said, in time unless your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees. He wasn't talking about Pharisees being in heaven. He was talking about all that outward appearance that doesn't mean a hill of beans. Righteousness is as filthy rags, the Bible tells us, right? God doesn't want you there. You cannot get to heaven on your good works. You cannot measure your way to heaven compared to anybody else or your feelings or emotions. It has to be according to Scripture. Except a man be born again, he cannot. See the kingdom of God. Where are you at with salvation this morning? Where are you at with your walk with the Lord this morning? God, I thank you, Lord, that we've seen in the truths here. Conviction hurts God as it should. It should, Lord. It ought to, it ought to be that burr in the saddle. Father, you asked or said to Paul, it's got to be hard for you to kick against these pricks. I, I can't imagine the time frame of Paul pillowing his head at night, thinking about the law and thinking about what Stephen preached and thinking about what he did to Stephen and Stephen's last words, Lord, just reminiscing in his mind and in his heart. And then that morning on the road to Damascus, recognizing and realizing who he is compared to you and trusting in you for his Savior, God, Thank you for saving my soul that morning, reading the Word of God in that trailer. Thank you, God, for saving me. I know for sure I have an eternal home in heaven, not because I'm a preacher, not because I'm a pastor of Baptist Church, not because I tell people about Jesus, but because I trusted in you. You died on the cross for me, and I repented of my sin and my way of thinking how I could get there, and I trusted in you, and God, you'll do the same for anybody. Oh, Holy Spirit, please, prod them, make it hurt. God, I ask you, Lord, if there's people here that you're prodding their hearts to take the next step, whatever it is, God. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe it's joining the church. Maybe it's serving in the church. Maybe it's getting enough courage to tell the coworker about Jesus or to, to pray during lunch, whatever it may be, God, to memorize scripture, just to, to have a walk with you, God. I beg you, prod them, prick them, Lord. Prick them, God. Make it hard that they would want that change of behavior. And be in the blessed hand of God, yoked up with Jesus, where it's light. Please, God, you work in hearts. Holy Spirit, stir hearts. Help us not to walk out of here without responding to the truth. You have your will in your way, God. Please bless the invitation. We ask it in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. The altar's open. Maybe say, I've never been to an altar. It won't hurt you. You really want to do business with God, you feel like God's moving, you go to the altar and just talk to him. Repent, lay it all out there. That's what an altar's for. We're not legalists. You don't have to come to the altar, but I'm just going to tell you, if God's working in your heart, I will say this as a pastor and a preacher of the Word of God. You've got to respond to what the Bible says. You have to respond. 
Knowledge will not fix you. The only thing that's going to take that pain away, that prodding away, is by you submitting to the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. Take some time and talk with